Hello and welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Dickie George. I started to work at uh, the National Security Agency, or NSA, as I'll be talking about it for the rest of the talk, in 1970. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about something that happened in the 70s. It was the development of DES, which was the commercial standard algorithm that the government provided for banking, people like that. Uh, you're welcome to ask any questions you have by typing them into the chat module on your screen. If throughout the talk, if the questions are simple, I'll answer them when they're given. If they're more complicated, I'll probably wait till the end. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, um, I'm going to set the stage a little bit by telling you what life was like back in 1970. And remember, this is the early 70s. So when I started at NSA, we had an organization of about 3,000 people. It was the uh, information assurance, the communication security part of the organization that did the defensive work for the National Security Agency. 3,000 people in that organization did not own a computer. So computers were, were not that standard at that time. We did get one a couple of years later. At that time, computers were just starting. And I, I, as a mathematician, really didn't know anything about cryptography. The only crypto I had and any uh, knowledge of it all was World War II stuff, Enigma and Purple. And as far as the average person knew, that stuff went away at the end of World War II. I didn't. It was still around. And in 1972, the government decided that computers were starting to, to be used in things like banking. The government needed some kind of a standard algorithm to use for protection. And the National Bureau of Standards, which is now NIST, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NBS was tasked with coming up with this algorithm. Well, NBS didn't actually have any crypto people at that time. So they came to NSA to ask if NSA would provide an algorithm. There was a lot of interesting chatter at NSA about whether they should do that or not. And remember, there are, on the order, there are hundreds of mathematicians at NSA. And everybody was talking about this and everybody had an opinion and not, not at all uniform about what we should do. Most people thought it'd be, be probably smart for us to stay out of it because there were too many bad things that could happen. If, if we did a bad job of designing it, people would think that we were incompetent. Uh, it, it was just easy to say, uh, and yes, go ahead and create the algorithm. What we will do is partner with you and we'll evaluate the, the proposal and see whether it's good or not. And we will, we will let you know if there are any attacks that are, that are short of exhaustion. Exhaustion, by the way, is you know, if, you, uh, if you look at a crypto logic, there are a lot of steps. It's a very complicated algorithm, but you assume that the adversary knows what that algorithm is. The part they don't know is the crypto variable. And, and the outside is often called the key. That crypto variable is, is a set of bits. You can always try all possible bits and look and see how it, how it uh, decrypts. If you have a message and you decrypt the message and it makes sense, that's likely the crypto variable. The, the cost of trying all those possible crypto variables is called exhaustion. So that's what you shoot for. You don't want any attacks that are cheaper than just trying all the possibilities. So we, we sat back and said, NBS, we will be the honest brokers. We will do an evaluation of this and we will tell you what we come up with. We'll make sure that the algorithm that you propose is as good as advertised. Uh, and that was the agreement that was reached. So then things got interesting. Uh, it, it, it's, DES is, is an important step in crypto history for the country. And let me explain why. At this time, all cryptography was done by the government. It was, it was all used for protecting government secrets. When DES was first proposed for public use, the outside world really didn't have much in the way of interest of cryptography. 
for a couple of reasons. It, it wasn't a hot topic, but they also didn't have a good problem to work on. Well, when DES entered the picture, it in fact was a good problem for the outside world to work on. And that, that, that sparked interest in this. And in fact, for those of you who are familiar with crypto at, at all today, there are things like uh, Diffie-Hellman Exchange, uh, the RSA algorithm. RSA is for Revest Shamir Edelman. If you're familiar with those, four of those people got their interest in crypto by looking at DES. And that was Hellman, Diffie, Revest, and Shamir. They all got their start. I'm not sure about Len Edelman, whether he did or not, but, but he's He's not as public as the others, but in talking with the others, I know that they all got their start through DES. So DES had a, had a key role in the whole development of, of the interest in cryptography in the public. In 1972, when it was decided that the National Bureau of Standards would create this algorithm, they put out a call for people to propose algorithms to be used as the data encryption standard. There were three responses to that call and all three were professors looking for grants to study the problem, which was not at all what they were looking for. They were looking for an actual algorithm. Uh, they came back to NSA and said, there were no takers, what should we do? Then there was more discussion. Should NSA actually develop the algorithm we started actually thinking about developing an algorithm. And then uh, one of the, the deputy director for communication security, he was the, the head of the defensive side of NSA, in talking to some of his colleagues found that IBM was actually working on an algorithm which they were planning to commercialize. It was called Lucifer. So he talked to, to IBM and convinced them that in the interest of the nation, they should actually submit this algorithm as a candidate for the data encryption standard. When he told NBS this, they put out another call. And again, there were, there were three responses to that call. One was a professor who was again, looking for a grant to study the problem. Another was another company that wanted to propose an algorithm, but they wanted to keep the algorithm secret. And one of the rules of this was that the algorithm had to be open to the public. It, it was going to be examined by the public. It had to have public faith because it was being used by the public. And when that company said that they would not tell NBS what the algorithm was, they pretty much disqualified themselves from the competition. The third candidate was in fact, this algorithm called Lucifer, which actually then was chosen and it became the data encryption standard. Now, keep in mind, this is, when, you, when you're talking about crypto, you have that algorithm, you have the crypto variable, you have a lot of interesting things that happen inside the algorithm. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those pieces right now. So the first thing is the crypto variable, and it's how many bits, how many bits should it have? When the proposal came forward, it came in at, with 128 bits as a proposed crypto variable length. And that caused some consternation. Of course, part of it was the uh, signals intelligence part of the agency, which didn't really like NSA vetting an algorithm that could be used that, that they couldn't break. And uh, of course, they weren't gonna be able to break the, the result no matter what happened. Uh, it caused some problems. The bigger problem was with the communications security part of the agency, the defensive part. We put a lot of effort into designing algorithms and designing them very carefully. And let me give you an example of, of how carefully we designed these things. Uh, one of the first algorithms that I started working on was used in, in radios. That algorithm was designed in 1957. We studied it for about 11 years. And after 11 years, we decided that it was good enough. We had tweaked everything that needed to be tweaked. So 11 years of work in looking at that algorithm, we decided it was good enough. Then we started building it. 
the key to cryptography really is the implementation because you're not really attacking the theoretical thing. You're really attacking what was built. So we started building that in 1968 and it was actually fielded in 1976. So that's another eight years. It took from, it, it took basically 19 years to go from design to fielding of that algorithm. And that's how careful we were. Every time we were building something, if there was any problem at all, we fixed that problem. So uh, one of the things that I did on that algorithm was called a, a failure analysis. So we took the engineering diagram of, of what that algorithm was, and we went through and we looked at every single thing that could happen. We, we broke every possible wire. This is all on paper. We, we failed all of the pieces in any way they could fail to see what the impact was on the output. And if there was a bad impact, we either changed the design so that that impact wouldn't be that bad. And sometimes it's just as simple as reordering the steps of addition can change things. Or we put an alarm in and it, we said, look, if, if this bad thing happens, we want an alarm that's going to shut the machine down because we don't want it to broadcast in an insecure way. So that's, that's 19 years of study to make sure that we got it right. Uh, NBS wasn't going to have 19 years. They were, they were going to have about a year to get this thing out. So it, it, was, it was tight. Now, with the crypto variable, they, they suggested 128 bits. We were concerned that U.S. government might think that this could replace the kind of algorithms that we were providing for them to use. It was not going to have the kind of study. It wasn't going to have the careful attention to detail. It wasn't going to have the, the careful implementation that takes eight years of study to ensure that the thing is good. And we didn't want commercial things taking the place of the government produced equipments that we had real confidence in. So we preferred to cut back on the crypto variable size so that it wouldn't be seen as a competitor for the kinds of algorithms that we were using. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in the agency about the size. And one of the things that I uh, found out in preparing this talk was about I found the notes that, that were a meeting that were, there were only three people at this meeting. The director of NSA, Jim Fraser, who was the chief mathematician in the communications security organization and the director's executive officer who was taking notes. So at some point in the meeting, as they were discussing how big the variable should be, the director asked Jim Fraser, how long do you believe that this algorithm will be in use? Now, the interesting thing was NBS planned to swap this algorithm out every three or four years, keep changing it. They didn't have the experience with crypto. I'll tell you, once crypto gets to the field, it stays in the field. It is murder to get that stuff out and it's murder to change. So, so Jim Fraser said, I'm guessing that uh, this is 1974. I'm guessing that uh, it'll be used until about 1990. And by 1990, by 1990, we'll need a new algorithm. And so the director said, how, how much crypto variable do we need to have in order to be good until 1990? And Jim Fraser said, 56 bits. If, if you make it 56 bits, that will be good just until 1990. By 1990, we expect that we'll be able to break that. And so he said, done, 56 bits. They called the uh, director of NBS and they agreed on that. I have a question. Did IBM have any business reason to participate? Um, they did not really have a, a business reason. In fact, they were giving up an opportunity to provide this commercially. Of course, now, at the same time, they were the people that were designing this, and it did give them a head start in actually implementing it as a commercial product. So they were the ones that knew it best, but they, 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 didn't, they no longer had a monopoly on the algorithm. 
So it, it, I, I would not say it was for prestige. I, I would say they did it for the good of the country. The country needed it. They looked like they were the only ones that, that had something that would work. And, and so they said, yeah, we, we will we'll take that hit for the team. So we got to 56 bits. Now, the interesting thing was that 56 bit answer was really controversial. There were a lot of people on the outside that thought that was very small. Uh, they thought it should be much bigger than that. Well, we knew some things that said, given the designs, it really can't be much bigger than that because we would have a little bit of a problem if it was bigger than that. And that's a story we'll get into later. But uh, there, was, there, there were some good things and some bad things about that. If people were worried about the 56 bits, that made our signals intelligence directorate very happy because it meant that probably people weren't going to use it. They weren't going to have to worry about the fact that they, they really couldn't break it effectively. At the same time, we were happy because it meant that our constituents, or the, the military, was not going to think that this was a good substitute for the stuff that we were giving them to use. So we satisfied everybody in that sense. It also gave people a great problem to work on because they thought 56 bits, I'm gonna be able to break this. There were a lot of very, very good papers written on this. And Marty Hellman had, had, a, had a really good paper that, that he wrote and he did a great job of trying to argue that that wasn't long enough. But we, we carefully analyzed all the work that was done and none of those papers produced really practical attacks. There were, there were some theoretical things, but even the theoretical things were not really cheaper than exhaustion. So we, we were pretty happy with what was done. Now, another feature was the, um, the key schedule. So the crypto variable schedule, that's the order that the bits are used because the, the 60, by the way, the 56 bits was padded to 64 because we always in the, in the, communication security world, we always add parity on to ensure that you've loaded the crypto variable right. You load it, you check the parity. If the parity doesn't match, then you know you've, you've made a mistake and you load it again. It, there's a real danger in loading a crypto variable that, that doesn't get loaded quite correctly and sending a message out. So you, you, you've got to be real careful about that. And uh, what they did was they broke it up into bytes. They put seven bits in each of eight bytes and then the eighth bit was stuck in either a zero or a one to make an odd number of ones in the byte. And that was the parity. All 64 bits were used many times. And so there was an ordering that they were used and it was a very, very simple key schedule that they used. And that drove several people a little bit crazy. Uh, Marty Hellman was one of them. He, uh, I, had some interesting discussions. I was another one. I could not believe that I couldn't find an attack against a key schedule that was that simple. And I spent a long time trying to exploit that, that long past the time when it was fielded. I, I was still trying to attack that algorithm to see if there was anything I could do with the key schedule. And I couldn't. Uh, we had an agreement with the director of NBS that if we didn't have a good reason to change anything, we would not request a change. Since we couldn't find an attack based on that key schedule, we left it as, as it was. And you know, it, it still drives me crazy, but of course it's, it's uh, over now. Uh, it's, it hasn't been used in a while. It was funny when, uh, this, this whole DES story, NSA's involvement, was classified until the year 2011 when uh, I, I wanted to get the story out. I thought it was a good story for the people to have. And I, and I talked to the director of NSA and said, you know, this is a story that if we don't get it out soon, it's going to lose relevance. It's, and the people who worked on this problem, who were at the agency in 1972, three, four, they're, they're getting kind of old. So um, we ought to get it out while the people who know that story are still around. Uh, so we actually declassified the story in 2011. And, and I presented this talk first time 
at the RSA conference. If you're familiar with RSA, it's a it's a relatively big conference. It has uh, at that time I think there were about seventeen thousand people who went there, and the way it was, it was presented in three parts. As part of that RSA conference, there's a keynote section where different people come in and give keynotes to typically CEOs or, or CTOs from big companies. But there's one panel in particular, this is the crypto panel. And the people on that crypto panel are uh, Marty Hellman, and Whit Diffie from Diffie Hellman, uh, Adi Shamir from RSA and Ron Rivest from RSA. And for 2011, they added me to that panel and we talked about the NSA role in DES because all these guys had worked on analyzing DES. It had all been classified. They hadn't been able to ask any questions about it, but they could have asked all the questions they wanted. They weren't getting any answers. So when it was announced that there were going to be five people on the panel, and this was what the, the topic was, I got inundated with, with emails from these guys asking all the questions that they wanted the answers to. And I had to tell them that those are good questions, and I'm not going to answer them until we're on the stage in the keynote. It's going to be fun. We'll have a good time. But uh, in particular, I enjoyed getting one from Marty Hellman. He said, you know, I've been waiting 30 years for this answer. I might die before the conference. You've got to tell me now. I told him, no, Marty, you're in good shape, and you're not going to die. It'll be, it'll be great. So well, we had a good time, and, and it was the question about the key schedule. He was just dying. Why, why on earth did I let that key schedule go through that way? And the answer was because we had this agreement with the National Bureau of Standards that we wouldn't change something unless we had an attack based on it. So we left that there. Now, the next piece, with CryptoVero, the next piece, every algorithm has a nonlinear part to get to get to make it complicated. If it's if it's just linear, the, the thing kind of falls apart. You need the nonlinear part. And this was back in the early days of the stuff. So the nonlinear part of this album was called S-boxes. There were 32 permutations on the numbers from zero to 15. Now, the, the, the permutations, that they just move it around, move the numbers around. So we asked, when IBM submitted that proposal, we told them, well, we're going to give you criteria for these S-boxes and that you'll have to change them from the way they are because we, we need them to be good. We, we gave them eight criteria to how they generate these S-boxes. There were actually nine criteria. The ninth criteria blocked differential cryptanalysis. Differential cryptanalysis was classified at the time. Nobody on the outside knew about it. And we didn't want this thing to be vulnerable to a differential cryptanalytic attack. So we had that ninth criteria and we told IBM, here are eight criteria, generate 10,000 permutations and, and send them to us, and we'll pick a subset that you should use. And what we figured we'd do is we'd bring it in, we'd apply the ninth criteria to all those things and see which one satisfied the ninth criteria, and we just use those. Well, surprise, surprise. The ninth criteria was harder to satisfy than we thought. So when they submitted 10,000 of these permutations, none of them met the ninth criteria. So uh, we had to go in and generate our own S boxes and sent them back and said, please use these. Now, we weren't sure that they would actually check to see whether those were in the original set they supplied or not. But as, as one of the members of the team said, we submitted a, a bunch of S boxes to them and they came back look, looking all different. And we were told to use those, so we used them. Um, that led to a very interesting result. A lot of people thought that NSA has put a back door, a hook into this algorithm. And it must be in these S boxes that they substituted, the, the, the substitution for the ones that were provided to them. And so, one of the cool things about permutations on zero to 15, when you look at those numbers, it, it's like, you, you know, a, a batter who's, who's hot. Your batters don't stay hot for a season, but there are stretches where they're hot and you see funny things. The eyes can find patterns 
in numbers. You can always find patterns in numbers. And the number of papers that were written by people who claim to have found evidence of the back door in these S boxes, it was, it was a huge number of papers. And it was really interesting to see that. Now, that made the people in the SIGINT organization really, really happy because they figured if people believed that NSA had put a back door in, no one was going to use this algorithm. So they, they were really happy. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating to see all the work that was done on those S boxes. Now, what we really did, of course, was put S boxes in that wouldn't lead to a problem. We put a lot of time and effort into this DES. One of the really interesting things about that was that there were various teams that set up and these teams didn't really didn't know that all the other ones existed. When I was developing this talk in 2011, one of the people I talked to was, was a, a guy who worked at NSA who was my best friend at the time. And we worked together every day for until he retired. For about 35 years, we worked together every day. Uh, he was my bridge partner. We played on the same softball team. It was godfathered his kids. You know, we were tight. We were together all the time. I was told him I was, I was working on this talk. And he said, Yard, do you want my notes? And I said, your notes, you never worked on DES. He said, oh yeah, remember in the 80s where they set up that team and they set up a team in the 80s and I led, it was a little team. I led a little team that did another look at DES to make sure we hadn't missed anything in the early 80s. He said, well, when you were doing that, I was on another team that was watching what you were doing to make sure that you weren't missing anything. And I didn't even know he was working on it. But he had some interesting notes and I was able to use that. Uh, I found that there were, uh, there were a lot of stories. There's this, uh, this oral history of what went on with DES that a lot of people had a lot of ideas of things that weren't quite right. And actually in, in his notes, that's where I found about the, the meeting between the director and Jim Fraser. And that was not in any of the oral history that I had heard. Nobody knew about that meeting where the 56 was actually decided upon. So it was, it was fascinating to see how careful we were in the development of this algorithm. Now, an interesting thing happened in, in, we are getting close to the end of the talk. So if, if you wanna be asking questions, it's, it's a great time. In all the outside work that was being done, people were concentrating on the S boxes and they were trying to find patterns. They were looking for funny things. They were looking at the key schedule, trying to find funny things. Adi Shamir, looked at a, an, a different algorithm, it's called feel. And when he looked at that, and when I saw feel, I said, this is gonna be a problem because it screams differential cryptanalysis. Well, he looked at that and he said, you know, if, if I do some of this, make some changes here and changes there, funny things are gonna happen. And what he found, he found differential cryptanalysis. And this was about 85 or 86. So he in fact noticed that there was, there was this process, differential cryptanalysis that lets you look at inputs that to have small numbers of differences and you track down and look at structure through the algorithm. So he found that, and I, I remember I was uh, having dinner with him one time and we were talking about it. This was long after that. And I said, so you didn't find uh, differential cryptanalysis and looking at DES. He said, no, no one could find differential cryptanalysis looking at DES. Way too complicated. Once I found it on feel, I thought it ought to work on DES. So he thought it should work on DES. He tried it and it didn't work. And he said he got really annoyed that he could not make it work on DES because knowing as much as he knew about differential cryptanalysis, it had to work on DES. Well, of course it didn't because the ninth criteria said differential cryptanalysis can't work. So he played a game. He, he took the eight criteria 
and started generating random sets of S boxes that, that met the eight criteria. Every one of those sets that he generated, his differential cryptanalytic attack worked on. And it worked very strongly. That made him more convinced that it had to work on the real thing. He tried and tried and tried and it wouldn't work. So he made the bold assertion that NSA had known about differential cryptanalysis at the time and had designed the S boxes to block differential cryptanalysis. And he actually proposed a potential ninth criteria, which was almost exactly the criteria as we had presented it. It had the same effect. He wrote the paper, it was a, it was a wonderful paper that really brought the, the art of differential cryptanalysis to the public. And in that he said, he believed that NSA, rather than weakening the S boxes to lead, in, to lead to an attack, had strengthened the S boxes to block differential cryptanalysis, which was exactly right. Uh, it, was, it was a very good ending. And that paper was published in the late 80s. And as soon as that paper was published, the world said, well, DES really is good then. And we said, yes, but it's 1990 and now you can't use it anymore. It's no longer, it's no longer proof for use. So uh, it was a wonderful 15 year run. I got a question. Was there any pressure from the signals analysis side of the agent to use S-boxes that were known to be weak so they could be exploited? Now, uh, there, there really wasn't. I think that was down in the noise. It was long before any of that, it was decided that we, we were not even going to think about that. This, this was a, this was a, there was no room for anything in, in, uh, in weakening this algorithm. This was something that was going to be used by the U.S. government. We don't weaken things that are going to be used by the U.S. government. We, we make them stronger. Uh, I, I hear a lot about people that, that do weaken things. You hear about, about hooks these days. I think in, crypt, in cryptography, hooking is very, very hard. In cyber, hooking is very, very easy. It's real easy to get software to do what you want to do. It's very hard to get crypto to do what you want to do. Um, but there was, there was no push at all from the SIG inside of the house to make the ES weak. And I was talking to Adi Shamir about that one time, and he said, why on earth would you want to make DES weak? Did you think the Russians were going to use DES? You think the Russians don't have their own algorithms? Of course, I, I, I did not think the Russians were going to use DES. So there was, there was no push at all to, uh, to weaken the algorithm. Uh, the, on, the only weakening we did was reduce the cryptoverbal size from 128 to 56 because we knew that we couldn't, we couldn't keep a differential cryptanalytic attack from being a lot better than 128. We knew it wasn't going to be better than 56, but it would be better than 128. And we didn't want our government users to want to use this product. Uh, we, we had committed to NBS that we would not let anything go out that wasn't as good as advertised. And this was 56 bits of strength, but it, but it wasn't much more than that. And so we, we were kind of locked into the 56. Which, which all ties into the 1990 good enough, 56 bits. Everything works nicely together. Um, that is the DES story. It was, it was a, a fascinating thing. It was, a, it was really interesting to be a part of it. I was a part of it from the day it started to the day it was no longer approved for use. And 20 years after that, when I, when I got to give the talk, talking about this topic and, and letting people know about the history. Uh, it, it's always fun to talk about things like this that are big pieces of our mathematical history. And, and DES was, in my opinion, one of the really big ones. Uh, a couple more questions. What was NSA's reaction to the discovery of differential cryptanalysis? Well, you, you know what's going to happen. You know, when I saw field go out, I, I knew someone was going to jump on field because it just screamed differential cryptanalysis. And that's the way you come up with new ideas. You, you, you have the right problem to work on. 
and that's that's the way that's the way you get there. Um, so what was our what was our reaction? It's too bad, but it was going to happen. That's okay. Uh, I mean, I was uh, Adi Shamir asked me one time what what did I what was my reaction when I saw his paper that had that, and I said my initial reaction was two parts. I hope he didn't find something better than I had found. And second, this is a guy I would love to be working with. It's too bad that we can't do more collaboration with people on the outside because we could do some really good things together. Uh, it would have been fun. Was DES ever cracked by any agency, foreign or domestic? Not that I know of. Of course, if, if, if the Russians did it, they probably wouldn't tell me. Um, but as far as we know, no. Is Triple D yes still strong enough for use? Triple D yes is as strong as advertised. And so you, you know how good it is, right? It's, it's on the order of 112 bits of strength. You can tell when you're going to be able to break that. You know, for, for, for people like us, yeah, it's probably fine. But there are things like AES out there, which are a little bit better in the sense that they're 256 bits and they're a little bit faster. So there's not much point in using triple DES when you can use something like AES, which is re really modern. A lot of crypto is designed to take advantage of the capabilities of the technology at the time. So DES was constrained to using permutations on, on four bit words, permutations on the number from zero to 15 because memory was so expensive. Turns out memory's not as expensive anymore. So you, you might as well use stuff that's good. Um, did you always want to be a mathematician? Yeah. Yeah, I always wanted, because it was, it was all I could do. I really wanted to be a football player, but I, I lacked size, I lacked speed, and I lacked the ability to catch. And that meant I had to be a mathematician. How did I find the career at NSA? Um, I was a senior in college, and uh, this, remember this was 1969. There were interesting things happening in the world. And one of the places that was giving out deferments was the government. A guy came to uh, the college I was at and asked if I liked doing puzzles. We, you know, we had an interesting talk about, yeah, I love doing puzzles. Uh, I love solving hard problems. It, it's great. And he told us, well, said, I've got some really hard problems that are kind of puzzle like you might like working with us. So I joined NSA. I figured I'd be there for a couple of years and then maybe go back, uh, grad school, teach, whatever. I fell in love with the work that I was doing at NSA. The problems were the best problems that you can imagine. And the people were the best people I'd ever been with. The, uh, the mathematicians I worked with, they, they were competitive in that they wanted to, to do good things for the country, that they were wonderful to work with, they, they were sharing, uh, just, just the best people you can imagine. And all they want to do is make a difference for the country. You know, that, that's kind of a good thing to want to do. So I, I got hooked on that. It, 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 you know, I, I look back on, on 41 years at NSA. Um, I respected and liked every manager I ever worked for. I loved the people I worked with. They were, they were fantastic. Great problems. Now, I wouldn't have changed anything. I'm I, I, incredibly lucky. Best time I ever I could have had. Nothing would have been better than that. If there are any more questions, let me know. Otherwise, thank you very much for being with us today. I hope this was informative. I hope you enjoyed it. DES is, is a wonderful thing. There's a lot of information out there in places like Wikipedia. It's not all correct. You have to be careful. When I was doing this study for this, this talk, I found there were a lot of things that I thought were true, which were not true. And I was, and I was on the game the whole time. So be careful, but it's a fascinating topic. Thank you very much.